Please do be seated. Thank you all. You sing so beautifully. Have you thought about this as a profession? <laughs> uh, I have in my hands the names of the winners of the cobbler contest. However, I'm going to read them at the end of this session <laughs> so that you will have time to congratulate them and look through their gift bags with them. Uh, our church has a long history of great Sunday school classes and great Sunday school teachers. Um, some decades ago now, there were two main classes and they captured the minds and hearts of our folks. In some ways, they were a bit competitive because they were both so popular. The Renee Williamson class and the Ed Grant class. Well, following his death, um, Ed Grant's death, uh, there was a fund created uh, to promote and encourage a teaching of Christian truth uh, throughout our church and into our community. And it's wonderful that those funds still today, all these years later, are able to underwrite events like this, uh, enable us to advance Neil's ministry by getting him the equipment he needed to be able to present lectures from afar, um, enable us to, to have the meals and all the things that we do. Um, we're very grateful for that. So we're on, uh, last night, um, Neil introduced to us the origins of what's called critical theory, uh, why it's called critical theory. I think an important thing to note is that that Frankfurt School he talked about in the middle of the last century, uh, there was a definite time when realizing that um, economic Marxism was not working, um, intentionally said, what if we shift this from economic oppression to social oppression and thereby gather and capture uh, the energy of all kinds of marginalized groups for our cause. Uh, it's pretty interesting, I can get you the documentation on that, to realize there was an intentional shift to say how can we overthrow what is normally called Western Christian culture, we got to move from economics to social oppressions, however those are defined. Well, this morning we're looking at one subset of critical theory, which is critical race theory. Um, something that not a term not many of us were particularly familiar with until the events of uh, late last spring and summer. And it was pretty uh, upheaving as a nation in the midst of COVID uh, to watch the videos of George Floyd's dying under police custody. And we were all shocked. And you know, the video presentation was just so, so moving and to us. But we might have also noted that in the midst of wanting to take time to lament and to say this is awful, something else was happening. Something else was bouncing off this momentum and completely taking over the agenda of lament for an agenda of activism. And it became the thing everyone had to do. And for many of us, we were a bit dizzied by this. How did this happen? It's almost as if it was lying in wait for a precipitating moment to bring in the troops and to begin to reshape the way all of us think and interact. Uh, that's when we started hearing about something that's been going on for uh, several decades now, the understanding of viewing race oppression through the lens of critical theory and what you can do to reshape society based on that. So Neil's going to be contrasting critical race theory with Christian race reconciliation and activity over these next two sessions. So... Get your slides up, hold on to your seats, here we go. All right, so we're back. So thank you for joining me for my second session. Uh, last time we talked about critical theory today, contemporary critical theory, as this broad umbrella category, the way that all these different social, critical social theories like queer theory, critical race theory, critical pedagogy, they share the same basic underlying framework, and they really function as a, as a worldview, as a way of seeing all of reality in a way that's very incompatible and uh, contradicts Christianity in a, at a basic level. Well, in this second talk, I want to take a deep dive into one very prominent critical social theory. That's something called critical race theory. So in this talk, we're going to be dealing with critical race theory what its origins are, what its basic tenets are, and then in what sense it's either compatible or incompatible with Christianity. So let's, let's start. So to begin with, here's an outline. I'll start by explaining how critical race theory and critical theory broadly are connected, how they relate to one another. 
I'll then describe the core tenets of critical race theory in a somewhat simplified form. There can be as many as 12 or 14 core tenets of this, of this theory. I'll just list four major ones. I'll then talk about some of the problems with critical race theory. Why is it going to be very problematic to try to embrace these ideas in our desire to achieve racial reconciliation and racial unity? Fourth, I want to take a little digression into the work of Robin D'Angelo, who's a very prominent anti-racist educator and self-identified critical race scholar. She, her work was recommended by a lot of major evangelical churches and organizations about a year ago. And I want to show you why that's a very, very bad idea to use her as sort of a, a guru for thinking about how your church should move forward on racial unity. And finally, I'll conclude with some more book recommendations. Okay, so let's begin by this question. How is critical theory broadly related to critical race theory? As I said before, critical theory is sort of an umbrella term today that encompasses many different critical social theories. Uh, and we talked last time about the, the underlying way that critical theory views social reality. Well, Critical race theory is one sort of sub-discipline within this broader umbrella, critical theory. Now, to, to back that up, I have actually, there's a video, I'm not going to show it here, there's a video on YouTube of Kimberly Crenshaw. Kimberly Crenshaw is one of the founding critical race theorists. She coined the, phrase, the term intersectionality, it's a very popular term today, we can discuss it later. But she also coined the term, the phrase, critical race theory in 1989. And here's what she says in that video. She says, uh, the refusals to recruit scholars of color at Harvard led to our eventual self-declaration as an offshoot of critical legal studies. So the original critical race theory was an offshoot of what's called critical legal studies. She writes, she says, we discovered ourselves to be critical theorists who did race and we were racial justice advocates who did critical theory. I sent out a call to attend a retreat called New Developments in Critical Race Theory. At the time, there were no new events in critical race theory because CRT hadn't had any old ones. It didn't exist. It was a made up as a name. So she talks about, you know, in a, in a humorous little anecdote about how she coined that term and she coined it because she overtly, explicitly was drawing on critical theory in formulating a new discipline. Okay, so right from the horse's mouth, you have her explaining how critical race theory draws upon this large critical legal studies and critical theory more broadly. Okay, so what, where did critical the race theory come from? The sort of godfather of critical race theory is Derek Bell. Now, he didn't coin the term, but his thinking and his writings about race were very popular and influential with later critical race theorists. So, he was a, the first tenured African-American law professor at Harvard, later left that school, and there's some controversy, which Crenshaw alludes to in that anecdote about how they wanted to find a professor to replace him, and out of that controversy was born the discipline of critical race theory. Prominent early founders in the 80s, late 80s, were people like Richard Delgado, Mario Matsuda, Kimberly Crenshaw, Neil Gotanda, and others, and all of these people were legal scholars. They were writing in the legal field, but a major corner was turned in 1996 when Gloria Ladson Billings and William Tate published a paper about critical race theory in education. So from that, from 1996 onward, critical race theory was launched into the field of education, and, and since then, it's, it's spread out into many different fields. So today, you'll find critical race theorists uh, in legal studies, of course, but in education, in sociology, doing history. And what's more than that, it's, it's, a, it's a acknowledged that critical race theory is very interdisciplinary. So people will, will draw upon critical race scholarship from many different fields, even from within theology. And people like Delgado and Stefanczyk will even proudly affirm that, yes, these people are using our methods and our, our ways of thinking in many, many other fields. So it's simply not true. It's very anachronistic to say that critical theory is just a legal discipline. That's, that might have been true in 1989, but it's not true at all today. So what are then the core tenets of critical race theory? I'm going to list, just for simplicity, I'm going to list four major ones, okay? They are racism is normal, 
permanent and pervasive, number one. Two, racism is concealed beneath principles like colorblindness, meritocracy, and objectivity. Three, lived experience is necessary to fully understand racism. And four, racism is part of interlocking systems of oppression. Now, if you remember our last talk, you'll see a lot of similarities here between critical contemporary critical theory and critical race theory, the basic way that it understands oppression and social justice and, and, and epistemology, etc. So again, that's why with the talks in this order, because I think if you understand the broader category of critical social theory, you'll see where critical race theory picks up a lot of these common themes. Okay, so first tenet, racism is normal, permanent, and pervasive. Um, I'm going to quote from Harper, Patton, and Wooden in their article, Access and Equity for African American Students in Higher Education, a Critical Race Historical Analysis of Policy Efforts. In that article, they list some of the core ideas of critical race theory. Here's number one. They say racism is a normal part of American life, often lacking the ability to be distinctively recognized. A CRT lens unveils the various forms in which racism continually manifests itself despite espoused institutional values regarding equity and social justice. Okay, so I'm going to just read these quotes and I'll explain uh, them in more detail in a second. Here's a second source. This is Delgado and Stefanczyk in their really seminal text, uh, Critical Race Theory and Introduction. This, or this is the cutting edge, sorry. There, there are two texts that they wrote. Uh, their introductory textbook is very standard. This is a second book, an anthology they wrote. They, again, they're outlining the core tenets of critical race theory. They write, racism is normal, not aberrant in American society. Because it is ingrained feature of our landscape, it looks ordinary and natural to persons in our culture. Remember back last time we talked about how people with hegemonic power, people like whites, heterosexuals, and men, they impose their values on culture so those values look objective, natural, and normal. Well, for critical race theory, that is the values that are imposed by whites on culture. The racism looks ordinary and natural within our culture because hegemonic groups like whites have imposed those values on culture. Uh, here's Kathy Kumasi in Levinson's Beyond Critique. Uh, she writes, race, the characteristics ascribed to a particular race, can and will change to fit a dominant group's interests. The dominant group defines and naturalizes these categories of race. In this way, racist behavior is not an aberration in everyday life. It is often normal practice in deeply racialized social systems. And I could list many other authors, people like Matsuda, Crenshaw, uh, Lawrence, Delgado, I've mentioned him already, but there, you look anywhere, Bridges, these are, this is a very common, maybe the most common core tenet of critical race theory. Racism is normal, permanent, and pervasive. Now, I look at that and say, I don't, I don't get that because I look around and I don't see a lot of overt racism today. I mean, I, I totally believe it exists. I totally, I have friends, I've, I am a person of color, I've experienced racism, I have friends who've experienced it, they can tell me these stories that are horrific. So I totally believe racism exists. But is it really true to say that racism is normal and pervasive? It's, it's everywhere? It's, you know, it's ubiquitous? Is that really the case? Because I look around today, you know, and I don't see in this overt form of race. I don't see people burning crosses. I don't see lynching, thank God, happening. Slavery has been abolished. We have on this, the books, the laws are now colorblind. We, we got rid of, we think, literally thank God that he answered our prayers and, and cleansed this country of the scourge of chattel slavery. We, we, we fixed our laws so that Jim Crow is no longer on the books, right? So, how can you say that racism is still normal and pervasive? I just don't see that. Well, that's where we get to the second tenet of critical race theory. Racism is concealed. Racism is concealed. This is, explains why you can look around and sure, it looks like we've gotten rid of chattel slavery and Jim Crow. We have gotten rid of those overtly. Those overt manifestations of racism are gone, thank goodness. And yet racism is still normal and pervasive because it's concealed. So here's the second tenet. Racism is concealed beneath principles like colorblindness, meritocracy, and objectivity. So here Harper, Patton, and Wooden again. 
liberalism, neutrality, objectivity, colorblindness, and meritocracy camouflage how racial advantage propels the self-interest, power, and privileges of the dominant group. That would be whites. Um, here's Hartlip. Uh, he writes, the overall ethos of majority culture promotes and promulgates a notion of colorblindness and meritocracy. These two notions are mutually intertwined and serve to marginalize certain enclaves of people, predominantly people of color. And here Delgado and Sifanchik, this is in their standard seminal text, CRT and Introduction. They write, critical race scholars are discontented with liberalism. Colorblindness can be admirable, but it can be perverse, for example, when it stands in the way of taking account of different uh, differences in order to help people in need. Crits are suspicious of another liberal mainstay, namely rights. They're skeptical, I can explain this, so critical race theorists are skeptical of rights discourse because it's seen as a way that the dominant group protects their power. They appeal to their, I have the right to this, I have the right to that. They use rights as a shield to protect themselves from real reform and revolution. Okay, so their answer to the question, how can you say racism is normal and pervasive when I just look around, I don't see it, it's not nearly, I mean, you can look at surveys, for example, you can see that people's attitudes towards race have really changed in the last 10, 20, 50, certainly 100 years, absolutely. So, but it's because racism, they would say, has not disappeared, it's merely adapted, it's changed, it's mutated, so that we now have what they call colorblind racism. We have racism that is concealed beneath the disguise of principles like meritocracy, objectivity, neutrality, colorblindness, and so forth. Again, this goes back to our critical theory talk, where what was taken as natural and normal and objective are actually ways that the ruling class justifies their power and their privilege. Okay, third then, how do we then see and unearth racism? If racism is everywhere, but it's, it's hidden, then how do we reveal it? The answer is through lived experience. Harper, Patton, and Wooden again. They say CRT gives voice to the unique perspectives and lived experiences of people of color. CRT uses counter-narratives as a way to highlight discrimination, offer ra racially different interpretations of policy, and challenge the universality of assumptions about people of color. <clears throat> Here's Kumasi. Blacks experience the power of second sight from the perspective of anti-black prejudice. A CRT framework recognizes the centrality of experiential knowledge of the people of color and views this knowledge as a legitimate, appropriate, and critical to understanding and analyzing and teaching about racial subordination. So again, the idea is that m people from the dominant group, in this case whites, are blinded by their privilege. They can't see the reality of racism in our culture, that how pervasive it is. But people of color, through their lived experience, can gain insight into social reality, and therefore we ought to defer, if we are not a person of color, then we ought to defer to their lived experience. They can explain to us how racism is, is where, where we can't see it naturally. Okay, and then finally, the fourth, fourth central tenet is that racism is just one of many interlocking systems of oppression. Okay, so here Harper, Patton, and Wooten. CRT critiques claims, it's critical of claims, that one can fight racism without also paying attention to sexism, homophobia, economic exploitation, and other forms of oppression or injustice. So the idea here is that racism is just one of many interlocking systems of oppression, which were outlined on those tables in the last talk, right? Racism, sexism, classism, heterosexism, cisgenderism, and so forth. Racism is one of these many interlocking systems of oppression. And CRT says you can't just pick out racism and dismantle racism alone. You have to take down the entire oppressive system. You have to tackle all of these forms of oppression simultaneously. Here's Yasso. She writes, the commitment to social justice is sort of central. CRT is committed to social justice and offers a liberatory or transformative response to racial, gender, and class oppression and works toward the elimination of racism, 
sexism and poverty, as well as the empowerment of people of color and other subordinated groups. So again, CRT is part of a larger framework which identifies many different axes of oppression. And here's Kumasi. Uh, CRT scholars are critical of any sociological analyses that focus solely on race without recognizing that racial oppression exists in multiple layers based on gender, class, immigration status, surname, phenotype, accent, and sexuality. So if you think you can apply CRT only to race, critical race theorists will be the first to tell you you're wrong. You have to recognize that racism is just one of many interlocking systems of oppression that must be analyzed and dismantled simultaneously. Okay, so let's talk about, again, some positives of critical race theory. What does it get right? Well, first of all, it is absolutely right that a race is a social construct. What do I mean? Well, clearly, some of us have ancestors from different locations, right? Obviously, African Americans in the United States, they trace their ancestry back to people that lived in Africa a long time ago. I am half Indian. My father is from India. My ancestors are living in India, right? Now, many, of them, many of them are, and some of them are living in Ireland or Canada. But the point is, of course, we recognize that there are categories, that are, there are populations that came from certain regions geographically, yes. But the way that we've categorized people as black, or white, that, or, or Asian, that is a social construct. The easiest way to see this is to look at the, cat, the racial category, Asian. That's, that's, I love that, Asian. Think about that for just one second. Have you ever been to Asia? I've been to Asia. It's a pretty big place. There are, it's a, there are a lot of people in Asia, right? And yet we, we look at people like, oh, you're, you're Asian. That's crazy. The, the people from Asia are incredibly diverse, ethnically, culturally, in terms of their languages, religiously. So these categories that we lump people together as white or black or Asian, that is socially constructed. Or another example would be how the category of white, the white race, people moved in and out of the white race throughout history. You can see it in our legal documents, right? There, there are court cases deciding who counts as white for things like immigration. Uh, when immigrants came to the U.S. from, say, Ireland or Poland or Italy, they were not known, they were not recognized as white initially. They were referred to by their ethnicity as Irish immigrants or Polish immigrants or Italian immigrants. Only gradually were they assimilated into the white, you know, white culture. They were grouped as white. So the point is critical race theorists are correct to identify race as a social construct. That is a deeply biblical view, right? The Bible recognizes ethnicity as a real category. Right? So ethnicity is a real thing. Our culture is a real thing. Where we came from, our people of origin, is a real biblical category. But race is something that we have constructed. These categories of white and black, they change over time. They're fluid. They're something that we have created. And actually, they're not innocent. The category of race was created historically to create a racial hierarchy and to justify the oppression of African Americans, African slaves. So again, that, they're right about the way race historically has functioned, the idea that it is socially constructed even today. Uh, that said, they're wrong about other things, but the least right about that. Second, racism has shaped our country's history. It, it just has. You look at how chattel slavery and the black codes and Jim Crow laws they shaped our nation's laws, constitutional interpretation, our, our, our just our culture, our social practices. Yes, indeed, we can be honest and say our country has a horrific and shameful legacy of racism and white supremacy in the traditional sense. And we shouldn't downplay that because think about it, as Christians, you know, I'm proud to be an American citizen. I love my country, but ultimately my citizenship is not in the United States of America. It's in the kingdom of God. And so we can look at the, the wonderful, triumphant moments of our country's history and also the terrible, horrific elements of our country's history and treat them honestly. So we should be honest. We should, again, we should be fair in treating our country's history and admitting the role that racism played. And finally, racism can indeed affect systems. I, the example I used from the last talk is valid here. Chattel slavery was a system that was based on racist assumptions, a racist way of thinking about reality, 
and it was enshrined in our laws. And it was taken for granted as normal and, and, and natural, right? So racism is not just about individual racial animosity, right? It can also be codified into our laws and our policies and even our habits. Again, critical race theorists are right to acknowledge that. That's, that insight's not unique to critical race theory. I think anyone who thinks about racism for more than 10 minutes will realize, yeah, I guess laws can be racist. And when we see a racist law, we should get rid of it, right? So wait, th those are some positives that critical race theorists can have insights into these various topics. They can. But I'm going to argue that critical race theory, in terms of its fundamental assumptions about things like race and lived experience and uh, intersectionality, those ideas uh, are incompatible with Christianity and, and specifically how we ought to think about things like race. Okay. So what are the problems? Let me list some. First of all, Christians need to see racism as primarily a sin, not as a system. So why do I say that? Because critical race theory sees racism primarily as a system, you often will have critical race theorists saying things like this. People of color are not racist. Indeed, they can't be racist because they do not systematically benefit from racism. Using the same logic, I reserve the word sexist for men. So you often hear the claim that, by definition, people of color cannot be racist because racism is power plus prejudice. Prejudice plus power, right? You can have prejudice as a black person or as an Asian person. You can be prejudiced racially. But because you don't, your group doesn't have institutional power, therefore you cannot, by definition, be racist. Um, here's another example. If you are white in a white supremacist society, you are racist. If you are male in a patriarchy, you are sexist. If you are able-bodied, you are ableist. If you are anything above poverty in a capitalist society, you are classist. You can sometimes be all of these things at once. So the idea here, not only is uh, racism something that only whites can exhibit because they have p power as a group, but also all whites are racist because all whites benefit from this racist system, okay? Now, I would humbly suggest that that view is incompatible with Christianity because racism is a sin. Think about it. We said last talk, within Christianity, my primary identity is, is, is as God's creature, right? The, when in David sins against Bathsheba, what does he say? He says, to God, against you alone have I sinned and no one is evil in your sight. When David commits adultery and murder, he still says, my primary problem is that I've sinned against my creator, a holy God. Well, if racism is primarily a sin, then I can commit a sin against, if I'm black or white or Asian or purple or green or orange because primarily the sin is against my creator. Not, against, not just against some other person. What's more than that, I, I am not guilty of sins that I didn't commit merely because I happen to have a certain shade of skin or a certain gender, right? I, you know, we all commit sins all the time. I have plenty of my own, but, but sin can't be attributed to me simply because of my gender or my, or my race, right? Now think about that. There's some, there's some deep problems with that view. Jesus himself was a man living in a patriarchal culture that was actually doing unjust things to women. Do we really believe that Jesus himself was guilty? That we could attribute sin to Jesus, impute sin to him, because merely because he was a man living in this, he benefited from this patriarchal system? Well, no, that's, that's deeply dangerous. So we have to affirm that because racism is a sin, primarily, it can infect systems, yes, but primarily it's a sin against my creator. Therefore, anyone can be racist. Anyone can commit acts of racism. Okay, second. Sin, not racism, is pervasive. So because one of the core tenets of critical race theory is that racism is pervasive, it's, in, it's everywhere, you will see them describing it like Christians describe sin. So for example, here's Robin D'Angelo. We'll talk about her later, but she writes, the question is not, did racism take place, but rather, in which ways did racism manifest in this specific context? It's always there in every situation, but how was it present? Not was it always present, but how? 
Uh, in her book, White Fragility, she's emphatic that racism is part of every interracial friendship. She writes, cross-racial friendships do not block out the dynamics of racism in the society at large. These dynamics continue unabated. Racism cannot be absent from your friendship. She says no cross-racial relationship is free from the dynamics of racism in this society. Now, just think about that for an instant. What if your wife is black or what if, or white? Or if you, what if you're in a cross-racial marriage, interracial marriage? I have friends who are. Do you think you could have a healthy marriage if you you are sure that every single action, every word spoken between the two of you contains some kind of racism. So, you know, you're, you're, if, if I, you know, I'm, I'm half Indian. So if, if my wife, well, I guess my wife is white, so that counts, I guess, but you know, she, my wife takes out the trash and I say, the question is not how was this racist, but how was that racist, right? You can't have a functional marriage or even a friendship when you think that way. So we, that, that's a really dangerous idea to bring into society, let, let alone the church, to imagine that every cross-racial friendship, relationship, what if you've adopted interracially? This is just sick. So again, we got to steer clear of this stuff. Here's another example. Uh, whiteness positions itself as the norm. It refuses to recognize itself for what it is. Its so-called objectivity and reason is its most potent and insidious tool for maintaining power. Racism is structural and it's insidious. We need to see how it seeps like a noxious gas into everything. Again, this is not some weird radical statement here. This is one of the core premises of critical race theory. Racism is permanent normal, pervasive, not aberrant, endemic, and deeply racialized systems. But we shouldn't think that way. We can't have a functional society or functional church or functional marriage we think that way. Okay. Third, identity is primarily in Christ, not in our ethnicity or our racial identity. So obviously, critical race theory and critical theory more broadly puts a lot of emphasis on our demographic identity, whether we're male or female, black or white, um, or Hispanic or Asian, or whether we're a heterosexual or a homosexual, whether all these categories deeply matter to our identity within uh, critical theory more broadly. And I hear an example from Adam's, in, uh, Adam's book, Teaching for Diversity and Social Justice, to show you how deeply these labels adhere to individuals. So they talk about how they're teaching about social justice at a university level. They write, the binary terms oppressor and oppressed may raise resistance from participants who cannot reconcile themselves as oppressors, get this, or who resist the term oppressed. On the other hand, we struggle to find other language that doesn't trivialize the power and harm of the oppressive system. Now think about this. They are admitting that in their classes, they'll find whites who say, look, I'm not an oppressor. I, I, grant, I guess I grant that I've never experienced the level of racism that some of my black and Hispanic friends have, sure, but I'm not out there oppressing people. They say, no, because of your demographic group, you are an oppressor. And they even admit that they encounter people of color or women or other minoritized groups. They say, oh, look, I'm not oppressed. They say, no, you are oppressed. This is your identity. That's an unhealthy way to think about reality. Again, imagine embracing that idea that because of your race, not because of your behavior, not because of your, your thinking, not because of your beliefs, because merely because of your skin color, you are an oppressor or, or this other person is oppressed. Imagine walking into church and thinking not, brother in Christ, sister in Christ, sister in Christ, brother in Christ, by thinking oppressed, oppressor, oppressed, oppressor. That, that would be death to the church. We're supposed to have this deep unity in Christ that's based upon our shared identity as children of God. That's got to come first before any other identities. Here's our Robin D'Angelo again in White Fragility. She writes, a positive white identity is an impossible goal. White identity is inherently racist. White people do not exist outside the system of white supremacy. So you say, well, wait a minute. Okay, let's, I get that. Okay. So I got, I got a solution. I'm not white. I'm Irish. I, or I'm Italian. Or I, you know, I, I'll, 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 I'll identify not as white. I'll identify by, by my ethnicity, right? 
wrong. She goes on. This does not mean that we should stop identifying as white and start claiming only to be Italian or Irish. To do so is to deny the reality of racism in the here and now, and this denial would simply be colorblind racism. Rather, I strive to be less white. To be less white is to be less racially oppressive. So again, D'Angelo here is telling you in her best-selling book, White Fragility, which was on Amazon, Kindle's number one or number two bestseller for June 2020, she's telling you if you are white, you are oppressive. That is your identity. You can't escape it. And again, we can't embrace that way of thinking in the church. We need to primarily embrace each other as brothers and sisters in Christ. Fourth, uh, truth primarily is found in scripture, not in experience. Again, we see the exalted role of lived experience in passages like this one. Here's a Luo writing uh, in her book, So You Want to Talk About Race. She writes, it is about race. So she says, when, it, when is some incident about race? She writes, it's about race. If a person of color thinks it's about race. Whether or not someone is fallible is beside the point. We are, each and every one of us, a collection of our lived experiences, and our experiences are valid. That You cannot deny someone's lived experience. If they say it's about race, it is about race, period. Here's another example from Collins. She writes, identity politics valorizes the experiences of women, people of color, poor people, LGBTQ people, and similarly subordinated people as a source of epistemic agency. By claiming the authority of their experience, standpoint epistemology defends the integrity of individuals and groups in interpreting their own experiences. So again, lived experience gives us this special access to truth and is a source of agency and authority. But here's the problem. We cannot trust our experiences. Our experiences can be wrong. They can be misleading. Ultimately, in our hearts, the Bible says, are wicked and deceitful. So we always have to, you know, I'm not saying that our experiences are always false. If I say I ate Cheerios for breakfast, you shouldn't say, what's the evidence for that? And, well, my evidence is my testimony, right? That's valid evidence. We, we trust people's testimony. And yet, we always have to ask, is this testimony, is this experience compatible with Scripture and with the other objective evidence or not? If it's not, we have to, re we have to rethink or be critical of our lived experience. It cannot be the ultimate authority for us or for anyone else. And finally, sin is lawlessness, not oppression. Yes, oppression, actual oppression defined biblically, oppression is a grievous sin. God hates oppression. God commands us to resist and reject oppression and to dismantle oppressive, actually oppressive systems. Yes, but, but oppression is not the only sin. For example, idolatry is a sin. Pride is a sin. Things that don't seem oppressive to us, or maybe even aren't oppressive to anyone else, they are still sins because they're sins against a holy God. Sin is ultimately rejecting God's laws in thought or in word or in deed. It's lawlessness. So we have to recognize that you know, critical theory zeroes in, narrows its field of vision really narrowly on one single form of sin, oppression, and redefines it. But as Christians, we have to recognize there's a lot more to sin than just quote-unquote oppression. Here's an example. This is from Ibram X. Kendi, a well-known anti-racist scholar. He writes, anti-racist policies cannot eliminate class racism without anti-capitalism policies. To be truly anti-racist is to be feminist, and we cannot be anti-racist if we are homophobic or transphobic. To be queer anti-racist is to understand the privileges of my cisgender, of my masculinity, of my heterosexuality, of their intersections. Again, a very common idea because it's one of the core tenets of critical race theory. So what happens when we try to mingle or mix CRT and Christianity? The answer is generally pretty bad things. Here's a book called Can White People Be Saved, published by InterVarsity Press, an uh, overtly evangelical publisher that came out of a seminar uh, held at Fuller Seminary, which is an evangelical seminary. Now, in this anthology, the editors write that these essays in this volume deftly deploy cutting-edge theory in racial and ethnic studies and draw on critical theorists who advocate for analyses of racism that explore how other communities of color outside the black-white binary 
experience racialization. So this is definitely critical theory and critical race theory. So what happens in these essays? Well, here's one example. In Andrea Smith's essay, Decolonizing Salvation, she writes, What we presume to be true of the Bible is primarily the result of the history of European interpretation as translated into European languages. We would have a completely different understanding of the Bible if we read it, read it through indigenous languages translated directly from Greek and Hebrew. Now, is that true? Would we really get an entirely different vision of the Bible if we read it directly in indigenous languages translated directly from the Greek and Hebrew? Well, I don't think so. I mean, God would still exist and Jesus would still be God's son, right? So that's not even true, but it gets worse. She goes on to write that according to the European positivist grammar of truth, if proposition P is true, then not P must be false. However, indigenous epistemologies, that is ways of knowing, are not beholden to such logic systems. Beliefs, even systems of belief that seem contradictory to European and Euro-American culture, for example, Christianity and indigenous religions, can coexist in indigenous culture. Now notice, she's not saying that we think that Christianity Indigenous religions are contradictory, but actually that's not true. They are compatible. No, she's saying they're incompatible only if we accept European logic. But if we embrace indigenous logic, then we can ignore the contradiction. Again, that's very, very dangerous. Here's another example. In his essay, The End of Mission, Andrew Draper writes that whiteness is best understood as a religious system of pagan idol worship. As idolatry, whiteness must be dealt with like any such cultic system. Its high places must be torn down and its altars laid low. Now, I'm not sure what a white high place is, like a Starbucks or an Apple store. He doesn't specify, but he goes on. He says, if whiteness is a way of life into which its novitiates are discipled, then a Christian discipleship that entails a deconversion from whiteness is necessary if any true con experience of reconciliation with God, others, the creation, and ourselves to take place. We have to be deconverted from whiteness to truly experience reconciliation with God. Okay, I'm going to take a brief digression into the work of Robin D'Angelo because I saw her work being cited and applauded by conservative evangelical churches and organizations about a year ago, and more than, more than a year ago, and yet her work is really awful. So, I, I, even her popular book, Right, right Fragility, that, that's bad enough, but if you read the, in light of other things she's written, it, it puts in an even worse light. So let me give you some examples. So in White Fragility, uh, she recommends some th ideas that are just a, a roadmap to alienation. They're not going to produce racial unity, racial reconciliation, racial understanding, nothing. They're going to create division, and they're just terrible ideas. And we talked about how she, along with her co-author, uh, Sensoy, uh, you know, really buys into the, this idea of what she calls critical social justice, which divides the world into oppressors and oppressed. It's right there in a book, What Does It Mean to Be White? A table of Oppressions, a Minoritized or Target Groups and Dominant Agent Groups. She repeats all of that in her 2016 book. She also believes very strongly, as we saw earlier, that the white, white identity is inherently oppressive and racist. You can't escape that if you're a white person. But more than that, in her book, White Fragility, she describes what is what amounts to a giant Kafka trap. What is that? A Kafka trap is a situation in which you, you can either admit that you're guilty or in which you can deny that you're guilty, and that denial itself is taken as evidence of your guilt. So, for example, in her book, she says that white fragility is a state in which even a minimum amount of racial stress becomes intolerable, triggering a range of defensive moves. So if you're accused of being racist, whites get defensive. Okay, what are some of the defensive moves deployed by whites? She says they include feeling accused, feeling scared, emotionally withdrawing, or arguing, or denying, or saying things like, I already know this, or I disagree. So in other words, you can either admit that you're racist, or you can show that you're racist by denying that you're racist, because in that case, you're actually exhibiting white fragility. There's no way around this accusation. She says things like this in her uh, in her essay or article, Beyond the Face of Race, Emo Cognitive Explorations of White Neurosis and Racial Cray-Cray. That is a peer-reviewed paper in the Journal of Educational Foundations. She and her co-author write, Under the power of whiteness, the racial cray-cray becomes a socially sanctioned process of engaging in the lies of white neurosis that everyone is forced to perform. 
She goes on to write that uh, another author, a theologian actually, argues, Thandika argues, that raising white children to be white is a form of child abuse. And she says, though, we, are, we hope to offer a new approach to racial healing. How? By affirming Thandika's postulation of whiteness as a form of child abuse. So telling white people that raising their children to be white is a form of child abuse, but that is going to lead to, according to her quote, racial healing. Okay, here's uh, from a paper we talked about this, how she sees racism everywhere. The question is not did racism take place, but rather in which ways did racism manifest itself in the specific context. You find it in every cross-racial friendship. Racism is still there. So look, all I'm pointing out here is that these, these ideas, these popular ideas that you find everywhere that are rooted in critical race theory's basic core tenets, they are poisonous. Christians cannot accept them, and if we do, it will destroy our churches, it will undermine our theology, it will lead to all kinds of dangerous and terrible fruit. So I'm begging you, you know, we can appreciate certain things that critical race theorists say, we can see that there is truth in them, but we must reject this way of thinking uh, just emphatically and resolutely because it will undermine everything, uh, it will undermine everything we believe as Christians, we ought to believe as Christians. So finally, let me give some conclusions here. I'm, I'm by no means the only one who sees a deep conflict between critical race theory and Christianity. Here's Pastor John Piper, one on evangelical pastor. He writes, in its mainstream expression, critical race theory is another manifestation of the age-old enslavement of the fallen human heart to self-deification of my own God, self-definition, I will define my own essential identity, and self-determination, I will decide my own truth and my own morality without deference to any authority outside myself. These are the root problems of the mainstream scholarly decades-long development of critical race theory, and that is why it's being so hotly contested, and in that sense, rightly contested. So I'm not the only one saying that, look, these ideas are really, really toxic. So what do I recommend then? If I if I'm not if I'm okay, I'm not here just to criticize critical race theory. I hope uh, in the next talk I'm going to give some uh, uh, some hopefully constructive insight into how we should think about issues like race, gender, justice, etc. Let me give you some book recommendations. Uh, number one, my friend George Yancey's book Beyond Racial Gridlock. It's a really good, moderate, balanced view on approaches that the the church should take uh, toward issues like race and justice. He actually both praises and critiques traditional models like colorblindness or what he calls the white responsibility model. He sees them as ultimately, though, as not a good way forward and recommends what he calls mutual accountability. That it's, it hinges on, one, recognizing that all of us are sinners, all of us have blind spots. We need to come together then in dialogue to talk about what we think is true and biblical and to find a solution that all of us can agree on. We can't just yell at each other across the aisle. We actually have to embrace each other as brothers and sisters in Christ and then seek solutions that we all can uh, support and live with. So again, very good book. I don't agree with everything in any of these books, but I'm recommending them as further reading. To I, that None of them w would embrace critical race theory as an approach to racial issues. Um, another book that's great, it's a good read, is Brian Stevenson's book, Just Mercy. It's a very moving memoir. He doesn't really... In, in this book, I recommend much policy. Uh, it's about his work as a lawyer defending people who were wrongfully imprisoned and incarcerated. But it's deeply moving, and it will, if nothing else, get a conversation started on issues about race and justice in the U.S. Uh, another book, uh, Vodi Bauckham's book, Fault Lines. Vodi is a very conservative pastor and is very opposed to critical race theory. There are a lot of, I th genuinely, I think there are problems in this book, and yet... He's going to offer you a, uh, a different perspective, a conservative perspective on race as a black pastor who's you know, operated in quote-unquote white spaces for a long time. So again, I appreciated that he brings an outside voice to these issues that I think we often don't hear within uh, the sort of mainstream evangelical narratives today. And then contrast that with the next book, which is Shai Lin's book, the New Reformation. He's more on the progressive side of race issues. Both of those men are actually strongly reformed evangelical believers. But you can see, I think these two books are, are actually best read together because they offer you two different perspectives on race and justice. So 
Again, I think in general the church needs to seek dialogue, genuine dialogue with people on both sides of these issues. We need to submit our ideas to scripture and figure out which is most uh, the best way for us to proceed, the most faithful to what God says in his word. So once again, thank you to my wife and my, my colleague, Pat. I'm used to giving these acknowledgments in my talks. But I have one more left. Uh, before I go on to there, let me just say there are several resources that uh, you can access that uh, help me, you to grapple with critical race theory and Christianity that I produced. So uh, first of all, my interview with Pastor Mike Winger called Is Critical Race Theory Biblical? No. Uh, that's like an hour and a half interview. But we spend the first 30 minutes of that interview talking about race and justice and our shameful racial history as a nation without invoking critical race theory to show that it's possible to have these conversations, these, these hard conversations without invoking the categories or the ideas of critical race theory. It's, it's I think, a very good interview. I did a debate with Pastor Rasul Berry on the program Unbelievable with Justin Brierley on is critical race theory compatible with Christianity. Again, a helpful debate because you hear both sides. You hear me saying, no, it's incompatible, and you see Rasul essentially saying that there are parts of it that actually are compatible. So you can, you can hear both sides, very important in this discussion. And then I wrote an essay on white fragility and the worldview behind it at Ed Stetzer's blog, The Exchange. I think that's, um, that it's now taken down, but I'll put it up on my website. If you Google it, you'll probably find it. My website is shenviapologetics.com. And that's, again, closing out this talk on critical race theory. I'm here for one more session to talk to you about a biblical view of justice. So I'll give you some constructive approaches for thinking about race, gender, and justice from a biblical perspective. So uh, stay tuned for that. Thank you. Hey, well, in just a second, we're going to go to questions with, with Neil. But um, if you're like me, you're... you're Pulse may be a little higher than it was when you walked in here this morning. Um, so I'm going to invite you to stand if you would. Uh, we're going to take a moment of prayer before we uh, invite you to come to the mics for, uh, for questions and comments. I invite you just to take some deep breaths. It's lots of fun in a mask, but just go ahead again. Just breathe in deeply through from your belly. Keep breathing deeply and take a moment to offer your heart to the God of all truth and grace. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, fill our hearts, fill this place. Holy Spirit, living breath of God, fill our hearts. Fill this place once more. Holy Spirit, breath of God, fill our hearts. Fill this place. Amen. Please be seated. If you've got a question, you can make your way to one of the mics. Good morning, Neil. So glad you're here. Thank you for a great talk. I, I can't hear you. There we uh, go. I can hear me now. How about now? No, not yet. No, now, not now. Not yet, no. Huh. I heard you at first. Okay. They're having audio issues. One second. I'm checking okay. my texts. If you have a question or comment, you can go ahead and move to the mics now, and I'll take you in, in order. We've got about 15 minutes. I'm going to keep talking so that if uh, Neil hears me, he'll say something to me. Uh, made me get a chance to talk about ethnic Gnosticism, which is a concept of uh, Vodi Bauckham that uh, Neil alluded to without the, without the phrase, still, which you can hear me? Yes, good, which the, means you The can't. AV guys say they're waiting on a reboot, almost finished. Okay. <laughs> so one second, the computer must All have right. crashed. All right. You can hold up a question on a note card and I can answer it. Can you hear me? I'm assuming you can hear me. Yes, we can. Okay. Okay. Ethnic Gnosticism, you can't know what you don't know. All right. Um, uh, actually, if you have a question, you can actually text it to me. Uh, I can answer that while we're waiting. Oh. Here we go. Can you hear me now? There we go. All okay. right, I got it. Okay, Donna, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I wanted Speak to right know, into the mic, dear, so we can hear okay. you. Okay. I wanted to know if liberation theology as 
manifest in Brazil, South American countries in the 1970s is a subset of critical theory, or how does that relate? Okay. You know, that's a, that's a fascinating question, Donna. So I've looked into that a little bit, and I don't have an answer. I actually suggested that would be an excellent master's thesis because, for example, James Cohn is known as the father of black liberation theology in the States. And uh, as far as I know, he doesn't reference any critical theorists in his books and say, oh, I got these ideas from them. And yet, Paulo Freire, who is the father of critical pedagogy, wrote the foreword to one of Cohn's books and said that he independently discovered Cohn's writings and said, this is exactly what I'm talking about. So we have this really strange confluence of critical pedagogy and black liberation theology where they recognize the similarities between the two fields, and yet I can't track down the, the exact same source. So I, the answer is I don't know. Clearly the emphasis on liberation as the, sort of the main goal for humanity is shared. Um, ideas about things like, supremacy, like uh, uh, hegemonic power and the power of ideas these are all shared. So I, I truly believe it would be a great master's thesis or even a PhD thesis if one hasn't already been written. I actually recommend it to some <laughs> students that ask me, what should I study? And I say, this would be a great thesis. Figure out how Cohn's thought is connected to critical theory. Now, again, Cohn came before critical race theory. Cohn was in the 70s, I think primarily 60s and 70s, and CRT officially began in 19... In the 80s. Uh, but clearly, all of these movements had antecedents. So, for example, you can go back to Fra Fra Fana, Fanon, who is an early post colonial scholar uh, and influenced both CRT and liberation theology, too, I think. So, anyway, it's, it's complicated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Donna number two. <laughs> I need some help in answering when I am confronted with your white. You're wrong. You need to admit it. I flippantly mm. say God made me white and he doesn't make mistakes. But there's got <laughs> to be a better answer than that when I will not admit that I'm wrong because I'm white and apologize for that. What, how do we confront this barrage that we're all receiving? Yeah, it's hard because... The natural response is to say, uh, well, imagine you came to me and said, you need to repent because you're black, or you're black, you're wrong. That would be unconscionable. You would, never, you would dream, dream of saying to someone, oh, you're half Indian, you're a woman, you're, and, well, and you're, therefore you're wrong, you need to apologize. No, we never do that. In fact, we would be, just again, horrified and say that's just racism or sexism or something. And yet, that's seen as totally acceptable in some circles if you're a, a white or male or heterosexual and, and say you're an oppressor because of your demographic group. The problem here is that we're hitting sort of bedrock foundational beliefs about things like morality. So these fields tend to view people in groups. And so they would come to you and they say, well, you are white and therefore an oppressor. They'd say, well, I'm not saying you're personally a bad person. I'm just saying that you're part of this oppressor group, and therefore, because you're privileged by virtue of your group membership, you need to repent. And it's all, and it's it really is a different way of thinking about reality and and morality. Um, the so there's no short answer. You really have to dig down deep and say, how do we think about things like sin, justice, morality, our identity? Uh, I wrote a piece with my co-author Pat Sawyer called uh, Do Whites Need to Repent for Ancestral Sin? We talk about, so it's not quite the same issue and it's from a Christian perspective, but we talk about the biblical reasons why it's extremely dangerous to embrace this sort of group collective thinking when it comes to sin. So it'll give you examples like if we're calling people for, as Christians to repent for their, for participating in these systems of privilege, or repent for their group's past historical sin. There are all these reasons why that, that thinking, that reasoning is very dangerous biblically. Just one example. Jesus was a man, 
living in a patriarchal culture, right? There were benefits that accrued to men by virtue of living in first century Palestine. So technically, Jesus would have been an oppressor. Now, does Jesus need to repent of being an oppressor in that culture? Yes or no? And, and I've actually had evangelical Christians sort of struggle with that and say, hmm, maybe he did need to repent. I'm like, look, no, <laughs> no. In no sense was Jesus guilty for sin as, as a member of a group. No, because Jesus is sinless. That's sort of basic Christology. So anyway, that's, so the article is called Do Whites Need to Repent for Ancestral Sin? And again, Shenvi and Sawyer, it's on my website, but that'll give you many different arguments that show people that this way of thinking about guilt and sin is really bad. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Barry. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Shenvi, thank you for this. This has been uh, helpful to me anyway. Uh, you listed on, on one of your slides uh, and the timetable I think was 1996, showing that uh, William Tate was participating in the development of critical race theory. Uh, he, of course, has since become president of the Louisiana State University system. Um, mm. Do you know if his uh, designs on that have changed over the years? Do you know what his position is today? I'm, I'm assuming it's the same William T. I didn't know that. Uh, I would guess they haven't changed. I think I've read papers of his from the 2000s where he's still, still you know, doing CRT in education. So I would be surprised if he totally recanted on his, on his views. Um, and it's just to be clear, it's not that William Tate and Ladson Billings are sort of unique or outliers. I would argue that CRT is really the, the guiding framework of education today. Uh, the, the biggest teachers union in the U.S. a few months ago passed a resolution saying they want to teach, they use the tools of critical race theory in education. <laughs> the funny thing is like a few, you know, a year ago they were saying this is all total nonsense, it's not even there. And then a few months ago, they passed a resolution affirming that, yes, indeed, these are valuable ways to think about race in education, and there's a largest teachers union in the U.S. I think the second largest union also passed a statement favorable to CRT. Um, so, so I, I don't know about him personally, assuming it's the same guy even, but I, I, it's not just – he keeps telling people it's not a few – I want to say bad apples. not a few people who are espousing these ideas. And if we could just get rid of those people – it all go away. No, this is the way that uh, the, I'd say majority of, say, race scholars today think. Kimberly Crenshaw, who coined the term critical race theory, actually says in a book that, or an article, she writes that today, race scholarship is synonymous with critical race theory. That's really interesting. Huh? So, so she, and I'm not sure if that's true or not, but she's saying when you hear race scholarship, that just means CRT today. So it just shows you how prevalent these ideas are. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Lauren had a question. Then we'll go to Lynn. So I have a four-year-old, and when you mentioned D'Angelo's quote about uh, raising your child to be white is child abuse, that triggered mm. me. And so I'm curious, <laughs> what does it look like in, in critical race theory, or in her opinion, to raise <clears throat> your child to not be white? Yeah, no, remember, this is the game they play with words. So they redefine all these words. So white, to her, she says in her book, to be white is to be racially oppressive. So what she's saying, if you translate her language, she's saying to raise your child to be racially oppressive is child abuse. Now, to some extent, that's true. If you're raising your child to be racially oppressive, that is, I guess, hurting them. Uh, but for her, it's all connected. So <laughs> but by definition, a white parent raising their child she would say, put it this way, with, with whiteness as a worldview to view themselves and the world through a white lens, that is oppressive. Now, if you ask for specifics about what is a white worldview, they get very vague. <laughs> so, uh, so, yes, the language ought to trigger you. It doesn't, keep in mind they've redefined those words, but what she would say is this. She would say, I want white parents to acknowledge their implicit racism, to acknowledge they're deeply embedded in this white worldview, they are had these racist impulses, and therefore to take on an anti-racist identity. All of these educators, all these scholars uh, would, uh, would argue that anti-racism is, is, is an identity. You are sort of reborn. They even use religious language. You're born again into an anti-racist identity. Your eyes are opened 
to the ways in which race is oppressive and racism is everywhere. And then you have to actively be teaching your kids to be anti-racist, to see the ways in which race has been as, as, as pressing people of color today, to, uh, to call out racism, to dismantle these structures. So all of that, she would say, so she would say, for example, she would say, <laughs> yes, you are racist, but you're not a bad person. See, because you can't control being racist. It's like automatic. You're born into racism. So your choice now, though, is if you refuse to admit you're racist, now you're a bad person. You have to do the work to own and dismantle your own racism. And you have books like uh, Abram X. Kendi has a book. It's like a board book. For, for, it's called How to Raise an Anti-Racist, or is it called Anti-Racist Baby? It's, like, it's, like a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a little board book with cartoons about how to raise an anti-racist baby. So... I mean, is it crazy? Yes. Um, is it as bad as it sounds? Maybe not, uh, because they, again, they redefine all these words. But you have, so I, I don't want to, it's very easy to say, they're saying that because your skin is white, you're an evil person. You're a devil. They're not saying that. Okay. That said, what they are saying is, is very wrong and disturbing anyway. So we should represent them accurately, but still say, look, that's not how we should think about our, our moral character are, are, I mean, I have lots of sin. I have lots of inborn sin, but my skin color does not contribute or not do to that, right? My social location doesn't make me, doesn't change my character, right? You, you can be a godly person from a lot of different demographic groups. You can be a godless person in a lot of different demographic groups. So that's where you have to attack this worldview is saying you're thinking about our problem wrong. It's not about our oppression, our oppressiveness or lack of oppressiveness. It's about our sin before a holy God. Our, our solution is wrong. The solution is we need re redemption and rescue and salvation through Jesus. And then our identity is found in Christ. So again, go deeper than just, I know you have this knee-jerk reaction. This is, this is racist. It's very understandable. But you should go deeper and say, what's the, what is the real problem? It's not simply that they're racist against white people. That's maybe arguable, depending on how you define the terms. The real problem is they've countered the gospel, they're anti-gospel. They don't understand our sin. They don't understand redemption. They don't understand identity. So that's where you attack the problem. Thank you. Thank you. I've got time for a couple more, uh, two more actually, and then we'll stop. Lynn? Okay. Oh, I two, can't hear you. Two uh, questions, please, and maybe uh, some simple answers. Uh, <laughs> one is, what, what can we as Christians do to counteract this poison that has taken over our so education I, I can't hear system? The mic. Pardon me? I, I can't hear anything. Can you maybe go to the other mic? We're turning the mic on. It's not, it's not the mic. Um, okay. All right. One second. It's a miracle. It's worked this way. Well. I just texted the really booth to see if they can uh, turn that mic on. Yeah, just hold on. We're, we're rebooting. <laughs> we have a boot. Anything yet? Up. Can you guys hear me? If you can yes. hear me, raise your hand. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, there we go. I can't hear the... You I can't, can't hear anything us. from you guys. <laughs> Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay, they're working on it. They're rebooting again. Um, if you, let's see. They're rebooting the computers. If someone can text me the question, I can answer it while they're rebooting the, uh, the computer. We, we need your digits. We need your number. I don't know how to do that. So what's the question? Okay, can you what? say that question again and then Jay will oh, text I got you. it. Can you hear me now? No, just say the question. Now I can hear you. Jail text it. Oh. Just say it in one phrase. Oh. Are we back? We're back. Okay. Okay. Here we okay. Go. <clears throat> Looking for simple answers to two questions. What can we as Christians do to counteract the poison that has taken over our education systems? And then the other one is... What is the common factor or denomination with these authors of the CRT books, 
besides anti-God. Uh, so for education, again, what I would do is do speak up at school board meetings. Um, I've seen a lot of you know clips going around of parents saying, look, I don't want my kids taught this in school. And oftentimes a lot of black parents are speaking up and saying, I don't want my kids being taught this in schools. I did not write, raise my kids to feel it, that they're victims, that they're always oppressed. So you should speak up. What I would recommend is make sure you can quote from primary sources. Do not just say, you're teaching my kids that they're white and therefore evil. Well, not everyone and most people don't say anything remotely like that. Instead, be able to say, quote, Ibram X. Kendi says, quote, that the only way to remedy past discrimination is through present discrimination. He says that on page 19 of Had Been or you name the, the citation. He does say that, by the way. Uh, I don't remember the page number, but it's in this book, How to Be an Anti-Racist. You should be able to quote that and say, does this school board believe that? And if so, you may not teach that to my kids. So it's really helpful to have a firm grasp, at least of a few books, if not the academic literature, at least popular books that are in best-selling authors. And if the school board, forget, if they say, well, we don't teach critical race theory, okay, do you teach this idea? I don't care where you got it. And ask them and say, I don't want this being taught. You are, as parents, you have certain parental rights and the school board should respect them. And again, I think there can be a coalition here. I don't think most people of color want their kids being taught this either. It's not just whites who are opposed to this. Lots of people think this is a bad way of thinking. Um, so that's number one. Uh, I have a piece in The Federalist, again, with Dr. Sawyer, um, about how to, uh, so North Carolina recently passed a bill opposing critical race theory in education, and we think it was a very, very well-written and good bill because, again, it used primary sources, it used very careful, precise language, it, very, it used very precise uh, definitions. So look up our Federalist article on opposing CRT through legislation in North Carolina. I forget the exact title. Um, that was number one. And then number two, what do they have in common? I mean... Anti-God, well, yeah, but all worldviews except for the Christian worldview are anti-God in, in that sense, right? So it's, that's not a common factor. I would say that if you had one phrase, viewing all of reality through the lens of power, power dynamics, that's the uniting factor within all these critical social theories today. Whether it's queer theory, critical race theory, critical pedagogy, they're all about power dynamics and seeing every issue through power dynamics. So that would be a unifying factor, of, you know, and like, because, you know, in some sense, every worldview that's not a Christian worldview is anti-God, but it's not a unifying factor. Great, thanks. Well, last question, then we'll take a break. Thank you for being here. Thank you for your lectures. It's wonderful. Sure. Um, my undergraduate degree is in English literature. I received it in 1989 from LSU. At the time, mm -hmm. these concepts were interlaced throughout the curriculum. So everyone who is in the school system right now teaching these subjects has the same indoctrination that I received. Um, and whether they call it by name or not, it's cultural Marxism, feminism, all of those things that you described yesterday. The second thing is that I'm a policymaker. I'm a school board member here in East Parish Parish. Many of you know me because I live in this community. And I will tell you that in policy, critical race theory, equity, all of those buzzwords, it is interlaced from the top to the bottom. It comes from federal policy, it comes from state policy, it comes from local policy. So our teachers are doing it in the classroom. You mentioned the National Association of Educators. They provided a curriculum this summer to all of their teachers and training how to use it in the classroom. We can't be in the classroom with our students. Um, I read one of my son's sixth grade social studies textbooks. This was years ago. He's now 23. And it was the section on religion. It was in uh, world history, I think was the year that year was. The, the course, the, the section on, on religion, I was reading this, and I was reading about all of the different religions. And when it got to the, the, the paragraphs on Christianity, there was a language shift. It was very subtle. I noticed it because it introduced doubt. It said, allege, they believe these kinds of things. But the other religions, these, these facts and the things that were believed by Islam and other religions, they were stated as fact, as though, and so read your children's textbooks. But it's our responsibility, it falls to us to, to um, 
mentor the next generation. And I hope it's not too late because this has been going on for decades, but I urge you to become involved with the state organizations. There's one called Save Our Schools and it has a Facebook group. There's a local and a state Save Our Schools to come to the school board meetings to ask questions, but mostly to look at the curriculum. We can't be in the classroom and we don't know what the teachers are saying to our students, but if we look at the curriculum and we talk with our young people at home because they are our future. Satan is marching Good. and he's right. having a field Thanks day. Thanks for that. We'll Thank let you. Neil respond to that and then we'll take a break. Yeah, people act, again, people will say, well, critical race theory only emerged in 1989 or something. And so, no, you can't read that back into, say, I don't know, Bell Hooks or Audre Lorde or James Cone. And I, I think what you just said is true, that these ideas go back way farther. So if you look at the early second wave feminist movement, you look at the Frankfurt School in the 30s, they had very similar ideas, not all the same. But again, we have to re uh, fight the ideas, not the label. This is a huge point. We get hung up on labels like cultural Marxism and critical race theory. And if you say, okay, we're going to ban CRT in the schools, great, they're just going to change the name to equity or they change the name to culturally responsive education. So you have to fight the ideas, not just the terms they're using at t today because they, those terms change. Great. Thank you so much. So we um, really appreciate it, Neil. We're going to take a 10-minute uh, break and then come back to start our final session. So, so. Oh, before we go, the winners, this we need, the winners of the Cobbler Contest. Here we go. In a tie for third place, there was Mango Cardamom and Razzleberry. Paul Algu and Carol Lazar have tied for third place. Make sure that's right. I think that's three. Where's the three? Yes. There you are. On behalf of your wife? Or did you make it, Peter? Paul is downstairs. No. They don't have the number. Okay. In second place with mixed berry was Rebecca Strupek. There it is. Well done, well done, delish. And finally, in first place, with mixed berry also was Lynn Tucker. There you go. Okay, we'll take a break. <laughs>